you know, yeah. get a bit deeper into some of the issues we've already discussed. And yeah, I it's something that it's like one of the ideas that like we've had UBI and we've had a couple other ones where once it's been explained to us, we've just been like, why is this not already? You know, the, the thing that everybody's doing, and like violence reduction is one of them. Where you know, when James came in and spoke about aces and stuff like that, I think the base has just had like the kind of penny drop moment on it, where you're like, this is this is the way you approach things. You know what I mean? So it's it's nice to get back into it. And that, I said we need more pennies to drop in Scotland, and it's get. I think we're we're getting really good. You know, I'm I'm seeing a lot of conversations taking place where people are talking about trauma in a way that we would never have talked about it five, ten years ago. Yep. Uh, and it's the people, it's the, the team in the, the BRU, it's the Jameses, it's the other individuals that have um, started the conversation and kept the narrative going from the start. This is early years. This needs to be a focus on early years, but it also needs to be a focus on inside prisons, victims. It also needs to be a focus on the bits in between yeah. who are at risk of being victims and of, of violence and perpetrators of violence. So, yeah. Hi and welcome to this week's Rebel City podcast. We're on episode 85 this week. Um, We're kind of turning around on a a subject we've touched on a few times um, initially with James Dockery when we spoke about Aces. Um, Subsequently when we spoke to guys like Graham also the young team um, when he talked about gang violence and recovery. Um, We've also talked a number of times in the past about you know the impact of addiction um, and you know Aces opportunity and, and various other sort of themes that kind of fall under the umbrella of violence reduction. Um, so this week we're speaking to former head of the violence reduction unit, Graham Golden. Um, Graham has got a 30 year career in policing. The last 10 year yet, roughly, um, revolved around violence reduction. Um, his experience and outlook on how we make you know, our country better in terms of justice and in terms of care and compassion is absolutely incredible like the, this has been a, a really great conversation that I've I know I've enjoyed and I'm sure Paul did as well um, we touch on all sorts of stuff the, the creation of the violence reduction unit all the way through um, Graham's work you know confronting notions of toxic masculinity how to be there for men and boys as they grow up and you know how our education system needs to be tilled towards you know basically gain young people the tools to survive and thrive without the sort of spectre of violence looming over them. Um, again, all likes, shares and engagements of this are absolutely massively appreciated. Um, enjoy. we do touch on men's violence today because we need to call it out you know there's a mm. there's some stories in the paper around what's happening at andrews university and a need for a national conversation on consent you know there needs, needs to be a there needs to be a national conversation amongst us guys what's acceptable yeah mm. that, that's that's it you know most violence in this world is <clears throat> against men but by men and we need to be brave enough to be asking that question you know and that's you know i'm not saying we ignore female perpetrators um far from it but let's mm-hmm. be brave enough to talk about where the... That's public health. Public health is looking at risk. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's what we... We need to be courageous enough to start having a national conversation on what's acceptable for guys. You know? Yeah, man. Absolutely. I will we'll definitely touch on that then, Mark. Outstanding. I, we had to read through the article and stuff like that as well. Um, so I, they're all, they're all I, right in the ballpark about what we want to talk about. So I think we want to just... Get I just do, do you yeah. want to just... Go for it, mate. Hi. So, hello and welcome to this week's Rebel City podcast. Um, we are at 80-something. Um, Worth count again. Um, this week, we're really grateful to have Graham Golden, um, who will give a few minutes just to introduce himself in a wee sec. Um, we're going to be talking sort of violence reduction in some like associated areas that we've touched on in the past with guests like James Dockery, um, when he came in and spoke about ACEs, and also recently, you know, Graham Anderson, the, the author of Young Team, and um, we've also got guests coming up in similar lines uh, in the coming weeks. And I welcome to the show, Graham. It's great to have you. Great, guys. Listen, thanks, thanks for the invite. But thank you for, for you know eighty conversations. There's there's eighty people that you've spoken to that you've spread this word out into Scotland, and 
you know, prevention and violence, which we're going to talk about, starts in society, starts in, in, in the different communities. And thank you for the leadership and creating the space to have these conversations. So I'm looking forward to it. Excellent. So in terms of um, your sort of previous experience, um, I think you're now retired, but were at one point involved with the Violence Reduction Unit, yeah? That's correct. It sounds really funny, retired. But yeah, I, I joined the police in 1987. I was 19 years old when I joined the police. And back in those days, when you joined one day, you knew 30 years from that day you'd be retiring. So the 20th and 31st of May 2017 was always going to be my retirement day. And I, I joined as a boy, very immature boy at 19, um, got into the police in Edinburgh. And um, I thought the only way to solve issues was to police our way out of issues, was to go in there and execute the warrants and search people on the street and attend the calls and get the arrests and get the convictions and send the bad people to the jail. Um, and I probably spent about 20 years of my career thinking like that, but occasionally having some doubts about what I was doing. Um, and really, 2009, I got a chance to work with Karen McCluskey and John Carrick and the, the, the Violence Reduction Unit. I thought I'd only be there for a year, 18 months, but ended up staying there for eight years. Um, and, I, you know, it's the best part of my policing career because it made me uncomfortable. It made me, I don't know, it excited me. It, it gave me opportunities that, I'm, that I, I can use in my retirement just now. But I think going back to that 2009, 2010 time, you know, the, the violence reduction, it forced me to take my police hat off and start okay. looking at issues a lot differently and look at them through a different lens, you know, through, through this lens of prevention. So, yeah, so I, I spent you know, ten, you know, eight years in the, in the BRU working with some wonderful colleagues, you know, Ian Murray, Keith Jack, Danny Stewart. You know, we, we, we had a fantastic time. We were given the space by the leadership. John and Karen gave us the space to be innovative, to be creative, to work on things, to try things, to make mistakes, to... You know, that, 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 that's what I really enjoyed yeah. about the time. And mm -hmm. um, in that time, you know, spent a lot of time developing school programs around bystander engagement, engagement we'll probably talk about today. Yeah, I retired at, at 49, um, still work very much involved in leadership um, training, but always looking at this violence prevention, this abuse side of things. I work in workplaces, do a lot of work in universities, and I'm supporting violence reduction. It's in England and Wales just now developing some school programs. <laughs> Busy. Retirement is busy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and for those that have no, I mean, obviously the, the violence reduction unit in Scotland was covered um, by, I think, Panorama through the week. Um, we'll maybe touch on that as we go. But for those who didn't see that and obviously don't know what the VRU is, that's, you know, could you just give us a brief overview of how the violence reduction unit yeah, kind of so does their thing? I think, you know, the, the, the Chief Constable of Sir Clyde, um, Willie Ray, so Willie Ray was credited with starting the VRU up back in. 2000, 2004, 2005, you know, Glasgow was seen was, at that time was really experiencing some really high, you know, high levels of violence, gang violence, you know, violence on the streets, you know, violence yeah. in the city centre, you know, knives being wielded about, just, yeah, just horrendous levels of violence. And I think, you know, it was given the, you know, that, that target badge. Yeah. Had that association with violence for, for centuries and I think at that time there's a realization that the, the old way wasn't working yeah and there was a need mm. for us to think totally differently around around this age-old problem of um, violence so I think Willie Ray at that time just gave John and Karen some space to do something a little bit differently and I think that's what they say that's where the VRU was born and this is um, where they, they approach sort of justice and as more of a sort of public health issue rather than um, a sort of criminal issue in a lot of respects, yeah. Well, that's right, and I think people often think, you know, I often got called the soft cop in my time at the VRU, but you know, we people still need to be held accountable for what they do. <clears throat> that, 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 mm -hmm. that didn't change then, and it will never change in the future. If you break the law, if you use violence, you will. You, you, there's laws in place to to, to 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 you know make people conform to that that that, that what, what's accepted in society, but the. Sort of criminal justice approach mainly focused on who's responsible, who's done it. And, you know, I think we love to punish people in society and we as a society love to be asking the question, who's done it? But we're not very good, although we're getting better now, at asking why. Why is this mm. happening? What is contributing to um, levels of violence in, in society? So we still need to do the who. We still need to um, work with perpetrators. We still need to support victims. That's crucial, how we work with victims. And also... 
what was discovered in the early years of the BRU was that victims and perpetrators are often the same people. You know, that's the okay. thing we don't look at. You know, <clears throat> you're in hospital with a, an injury and one week you're, you, you, you're the one with the knife or the one at the fight in the, in the, in the party in the nightclub. And yeah. that's why the work of the, for example, the navigators just now that are in the accident and emergency departments are really important because, you know, yeah. if you're back from one weekend, you know, is this, especially amongst young men, you know, I need to get my, my, my respect back, you know, so I'm going to go out there and do it to somebody else. Mm. You know, I'm, I've lost face. So <clears> what's <throat> happening in any departments um, is the, you know, interrupting, you know, that's the public health message. The public health is looking at violence as a disease, something that spreads, you know, people you mm. know, come out of prison and they are back in their communities, back in their families, with these violent, violent attitudes, with, with whatever's going on, and can that spread onto their sons, their daughters, their families, and to their into their communities? So it's looking about how do we how do we interrupt that spread of the violence, and that's what public health. If, if you look yeah. at what's happening, COVID, COVID nineteen just now. You know, in those first first few months, we are now you know, we are washing our hands. We were told to stay indoors, right? That's a bit containing mm-hmm. the issue, and you know, violence needs to be contained. We need prisons. Yeah. We need that. We all, I mean, we need police to be out enforcing the law. That's to contain and manage. But how do we shift the norms at the same time? That's the washing of the yeah. hands, the hands. face masks. So they, they, these are some analogies that I think society can start to look at to make the comparisons. Yeah, yeah. And something like the VR year could maybe be like the vaccine in this analogy. Well, that, that that's it. It's about you know they often say the hope hope is the vaccine. How do you give people hope? Mm. Hope that things will get better. You know, if you're a, a man or someone who's thinking of taking their own life, it's often a lack of hope. You need an alternative. So hope, you know, if you're a young man in prison with no prospects for job, job um, when you're released and you've got all this trauma building up and then James talked about ACEs and that from, the, from the early years, <clears throat> you know, you, you lack hope. You lack a reason to get up in the morning and we all need that that reason to get up in the morning and, and that sense of coherence, that sense yeah. of coherence. And, and you know of, of life and that, that, that that's important so these are the vaccines you need to out yeah that's something that's becoming even more and more elusive to young people is this sort of I mean, when we grew up in the 90s, there was a pathway that you could go one or two with the apprenticeship scheme or higher education or go and find a job and now, like young people, I don't envy them at all coming out of school if they're lucky enough to go to university. Even coming out of university, it's really, really tough out there to try and find that path to like finding your own way and having your own independence. Um, when you were saying about the the navigators, are they the guys in the pink polo yeah. shirts? So yeah. what's the like? What is the school of thought there? Um, because they're not police officers, are they? They're like more sort of community based style stuff. My understanding, when Keith Jack, um, a colleague of mine, was advertising, he wanted a thoroughly decent human being, <laughs> somebody with that ability. <laughs> and I know that sounds really silly, but you know the the greatest superpower that any one of us has is our presence. Um, and I think you know Keith wanted people with that presence that would make that connection. You know, every contact leaves a trace is a, is a saying we would be having the police. And we used to use that saying for like fingerprints when you. If you break into a house or commit a crime and touch something, you'll leave a trace of yourself on the car or on the on the wall or the door. But I think it's the same for us. You know, if we go in there with compassion, with understanding, with knowledge, with courage, we can leave a trace on another person. And that that's mm-hmm. really what the, the navigators are all about. They're about, you know, there's there'll be people more qualified to speak about it than me. But my understanding is that they are People are coming into any departments. They are victims of violence, potentially perpetrators of violence as well. Um, the, the hospital are treating them. And what the, the, the navigator, the person in the pink polo top does, they just go in there and have a conversation. How are you doing? And when you speak to Callum, you know, he'll talk about it. It's the first time someone listened to him. You know, mm-hmm. offered, offered him an alternative, you know, away. And look at, look at him there. That, that, that was so pleasing to see and Callum on the television. Um, speaking about his experiences, uh, outstanding, That's, absolutely yeah. outstanding. Yeah. So, so it's inside all of us, you know. All this, you know, we talk about, you know, and the police. I would look at people as bad people, but you know, these 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 individuals um, were in bad situations. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I actually I attended the um, online session in recent weeks when Graham uh, spoke about his experiences of gang life, and, and Callum was one of the people who commented after it and 
I actually, you know, got to hear him speak about his experiences firsthand, and like it was an extremely powerful kind of like he's just so hard not to listen to when he talks, and and I think that's something that's been quite important as well is that the and aid of violence reduction you have actually almost kind of like weaponized people with criminal pasts because I think the statistics show that they get the message across to their peers a lot more effectively. Is that your experience with this? I think there's nothing, there's, you can't underestimate the part of the lived experience. I think, you know, I'm a, I'm a former police officer. Um, you know, I was in a prison working at the start of the year down in Thames Valley and I know that if I just go in, go in there and either don't, don't be honest with them, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll sort of smell the bullshit. But, but so mm-hmm. I have to be totally honest and talk about my own background as a police officer, what I was like back then and to try and build that relationship up. But, when you look at James, Callum, Graham, you know, you've got Kevin Neary um, based in Edinburgh in the Bounty team, you know, they bring that authenticity immediately. They've got that. They're still yeah. going to build the relationship up with the, with the individual, you know, and that, and that person mm-hmm. still has to want to do it. You know, Kevin Neary will often say, you know, all we do is provide the opportunity. They have to bite. The other person has to come along with us. Um, but we do give them that the alternative. So I think you, you can't underestimate the power of the lived experience. And I think we need to make yeah. sure that that we see it as part of the response to addressing not just violence, but suicide, the whole rate, all number of other mm-hmm. social issues. Because there's individuals out there who bring a lot of experience out there. And, you know, working in a prison, I see some really well-educated, actually really caring men. You know, yeah. bad situation, they find themselves they find themselves going down another path. Yeah. yeah. Right, just trying to redirect them. And you, you can do that, you know, I have a limited success doing that with, when I'm working with, in prisons. It's harder for me, um, but I know that the likes of Callum and Kevin and James, I've got a real raw authenticity and honesty that they, they bring. And all, any one of us needs to be honest. Yeah, that's More, amazing. Totally honest. Um, something that jumped out of me watching Panorama, um, I mean, me and Matt both come from uh, East End housing schemes, as we, we mentioned a lot in the podcast. I think it's something that obviously has shaped the way that we see things. So, um, we've got a sympathetic ear and eye when it comes to people that are involved in violent crimes because we, I, I went to school with these guys and I remember yep. the situations that I seen them in. Um, but the one where the 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 guy had get out of prison and they were helping him return to the community he was at his grand's house, and he was so skeptical at the start, and then by the end, he, they opened the door and the last scene was he, he hugged the police officer. It was like the final. So I was like, that one, that's so amazing to see that guy's change. But I was saying to my girlfriend, like the first guy that you seen was almost like a wounded animal. He, he's he's scared. The violence is just seems to be like an expression of fear and like like you're saying, like a lack of hope. Um, and that was just an observation that I made. It was just so good to see, but. Last episode or two episodes, we spoke to uh, two Gallus for Black Lives Matter in Scotland, and what he said to me was, or what he said to me, Matt, on the podcast was that the people that are higher up in the police force, there should be a mix of people that come from both a police background and a non-police background. And he, he was like, I don't know how that works, but that is my general opinion. Do you think it would work to get people that have worked their way through, say, the care sector or the mental health sector? to like head up the plan in the police or how we tackle this rather than it just being a perpetual like you start in the police and you work your way through and then you become like the chief inspector or whatever like that. I think it's, it's a good point. And, you know, so it's, a, it's that the big conversation just now around the world is defund the police, defund the police. And a lot of people mm-hmm. look at that and they, you know, I think a lot of people think it, 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 means, it, it means just that, you know, take the money away and don't have the police. And it yeah. doesn't, I like to think of it as, as reimagining the police. You know, and you know, you know, when you asked that, you, you mentioned that in our, in our pre-chat and some questions you might come up with and basically putting this retired cop on the spot to talk about defunding the police. And, you know, <laughs> I, th- I, think, I think it's important that you know, to, to recognise that policing is really, it's, it's complex, <clears throat> it's really complex. Mm-hmm. What's yeah. going on out in, in society? Um, you know, we've got lots of issues coming from, you know, the, the, the terror threat, the cyber threat, all these issues that are at play COVID is the classic one just now. Big pressures on on, on policing. But I would, I would agree, I think there's a, already in the police, there's non-police heading up departments. You know, the, there's that entry level where you don't have to be a police officer to be head of HR. You know, you have to have HR experience. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's important to know that a lot of, in my experience in partnership working in the police is that 
we are already engaging with partners. We are in, in, engaging with youth, youth services, youth link, etc. Organisations who will advise the police. I know, I know, um, Nevin in the VRU is the is, is one of one of the projects is, is um, one. I think it's it's called One Community, which is looking at um, a BME. Um, group in the part of Glasgow and, and helping them be part of the, the, the wider community. So it's already informing. Um, but yeah, I think there's, there is a need to reimagine what this policing look like, especially with this, this lens of trauma that we have. So, uh, I think that, what we're, uh, so I think what we're talking about here in terms of traditional policing, shall we call it, just for the sake of this, is, is quite radical thinking already. Like when you were involved in this or even, you know, prior to your involvement, were you aware of any scepticism or sort of pushback against such a, a you know, a radical change in approach? God, yeah. Yeah, yeah. As I say, I think, you know, the VRU is still probably in some parts of policing thought of that, you know, wh why are we doing this? You know, I was, you know, I, I talk about it, but, you know, I, I was part of a, an old Facebook site, and I, I, I would often question the police officers. Thankfully, many of them are retired now about their views on criminals and, and their use of language, their use of certain ways to describe you know, that, that horrible word junkie. I, 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 even when I use it, I hate it. I hate saying mm. it, but yeah. it's so very much part of the, 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 the language of some, some, not all. And I, you know, I, I, I found myself getting barred for the site for just challenging some of this stuff. And yeah. so, yeah, there is going to be pushback because you know there's pushback from society. If you look at if you look, when someone's sentenced to, to 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 jail or some sex offender sentenced to jail, some of the comments on Twitter or underneath the story are really quite repulsive. You know, and, and as I said a while ago, you know people need to be held accountable. You know, the, 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 the example a couple of weeks ago in Glasgow when the the guy was shot by the police. You know, when you look at that that you know. That was wrong. What happened? I, what, what what that man did. But when you look at the situation he was in, you know that that, that tells a whole new story. So there's still, mm -hmm. a, 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 I think, a reluctance on you know in society to look at some of the approaches of the VIU. Because every year we still have the flat screen television chat about prisons. Yeah, I've got flat screen televisions, and and you yeah. often say, you know, what, why is that? And I say, to them, well, you can't even buy TVs that are no flat screen. <laughs> You know, it's, that's the point. There. <laughs> it's been twenty <laughs> years since anybody yeah. sold a tube telly. You know what I mean? Well, well, that's it. So you know, go and go and spend a week in prison. Yeah, it's it's, it's no nice. You can't if, yeah. if your mum's no well, your dad dies, your something happens. You can't just go out to the funeral. It's you know, and and you know, people need to be held accountable. And don't think that the VRU or Scotland's going soft. Not the case. Twenty years in the police, thirty years in the police service taught me many things, but it taught me that policing alone will not solve the issues we see in society. Issues, the, the prevention starts, to say that it starts in communities. It starts with, you know, me looking out for my neighbours. It's, it's me looking out for my, for wee kids in the street. If I see them at whatever time and they're on their own or they shouldn't be out, you know, doing something about that. You know, I, I, mm -hmm. you know if I hear my neighbours having a, an, an argument getting out of hand, you know, don't just stand back and let it, let it happen. What could you do? Could you speak to someone the day after? So I think, yeah, that you, you, you will get, you, you, will, you will get pushed back. I think that's sometimes forced now, I, I think, anyway, in my opinion, we're seeing this pressure on the police to to be that enforcement um, system, which we need We need the police to enforce the law. Victims need to be supported. Yeah. But, and I remember my old chief constable, David Strang, saying to me, we need to meet communities where they're at. And I think that's the, the reimagining of the police that I would like to see, defunding the police, reimagining the police, whatever. I want to, be, I want to see more police officers involved in, Good prevention work. You saw it on the Panorama program, the Bow Team, working with uh, with Kevin Neary, who was with, work, working with that young man in the community, building mm -hmm. the relationships up. And then the, the police officer Philippa, who I know really well, you know, she was really supportive. So my question to Police Scotland is, well, why isn't that in Glasgow, Inverness, Dundee, mm -hmm. Aberdeen, other big towns and cities? If you believe in that that much, invest in it. That mm -hmm. would be my sort of question for for you know. If it works in Edinburgh, which it appears to be working, and there's evidence that it's saving so much money and you know in services. Um, so why would it there is there is at least early evidence that successful violence reduction has a knock on effect to other public services, a positive knock on effect to other public services. But I don't think they're worth far enough down the line to make like a sort of full conclusion on it. Is that right? 
you know, I think there's, again, there's very intelligent people who will evaluate these things. But, you know, I just know when you look at Callum, you know, Callum's a, Callum's a, Callum's a dad. He's a fantastic father. You know, if he wasn't where he is just now, look at the impact on his daughter. His daughter. Look at the impact on that. You know, it's the same for all the other, you know, people, the men that I've worked with over the years who've come from that lived experience. I just see it. You know, if, if they hadn't, if they weren't doing what they were doing just now, they would probably, probably be either in jail or they would be, you know, abusing substances or, or, or dead. Yeah. And, and mm-hmm. you know, I think just when you, when you have that alternative, you, you know, I think we're, we're, we're all looking for the, for the, the, the big return on the investment. It's there. Um, mm-hmm. And, um, but, you, but you can see it. You can see it. You know, even Callum speaking in a prison with young men on Panorama. You can see it. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I think that's, that's we, we should be just looking at that as success. Yeah, I feel like this issue is akin to um, sort of the mental health attitudes within sort of a private business and private workplace, where in years gone by it was almost like. They, they didn't really want to know. It, it wasn't even on their radar, but then they see statistics about like 90% of, of sickness is mental health related where people say they've got a sore stomach, sickness and diarrhea, or they've got a sore head, whatever. It is more mental health. So they, they need to make that initial investment at the start to help get counsellors and support services for people in the workplace so that they can then save the, what you're saying, the, the return on investment is a saving down the line. Um, do you think that's as impactful on people when they can they need to talk about the money that's saved down the line rather than the actual like capital gains that they can talk yeah. in other areas? Do you know what I mean? A politician wants to talk about how many people were arrested and how many police are on the yeah, street. They exactly. talk about how much money the NHS or social care is going to save 10 years down the line. So it can be quite a hard sell, I'd imagine. Yeah. No, I, think, I think so. You, you look at, you know, I'm trying to think what we... We estimate, you know, a, you know, a murder in Scotland, a homicide in Scotland, was about four point three five million pounds. I'm sure that's what the, the figure was. We worked, that's where it cost. So per, say, wow. like per homicide in Scotland, that's how much it costs. Yeah, you know, when you bring in all the other associated costs, you know, Holy so stuff like that. Yeah, so Scotland's gone from like 160 odd or whatever in 2005 to 60 or whatever it was last year. So you know, think of that that saving that's coming coming in. That um, figure's incredible. Is it, but it's, oh, yeah. all, it's something we don't, it's the, the economic cost. I remember a couple of years ago reading that everybody, everybody who pays tax with their salaries, you pay about £1,000 a year to violence, to, to deal with violence. You know, by the, by the time you, you so we're, we're all paying towards it. Um, and if you've got a doctor who's, this, this came out, you know, the, 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 the height of the trouble in Glasgow was that, you know, your doctors are, are stitching up people, but they're not dealing with kids with cleft palates. You know, they're not dealing with, so hopefully now with the reduction in, in levels of violence, we're seeing doctors well qualified because they're very skilled up to deal with knife injuries, yeah. um, but doing other things as well. Um, but yeah, you're right. You know, the workplace is, you know, I, I work in corporates around things like sexual harassment and mental health and, and, and domestic abuse. Domestic abuse doesn't just take place behind closed doors. It comes to work. So, you know, so organizations need to be on the front foot it because it's, it's got the potential staff away sickness low productivity um poor performance retention all these issues so it's about investing in it but you know if you invest in it now then you yeah you can save the save it in the long term and it takes leadership you know i I talked about the leadership of the vru at the start giving me the space apply that to the corporate apply that to whatever good leaders recognize that good leaders are prepared to invest they've got guts they've got courage to think differently to develop the mm-hmm. culture, and actually, sometimes it does, you don't have to spend a lot of money. It's about creating conversations. You know, if you create conversations on in workspaces around, say, workplace bullying or harassment, you're actually communicating as a leader that you care about the subject. You know, yeah. most people in this world don't agree with harassment; they actually don't want it. So, if you mm-hmm. have the conversation in your workspace, you know, you actually send out positive messages. So, even, yeah. even the narrative in Scotland has been consistent from day one in the VRU. Early years, early years, compassion yeah. and hope, and it kept going from the very start. Yeah, I think that's really like see- the new economy and like the, the the well-being economy being like a huge focus. And actually, like, are you are you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Sorry, I thought I was breaking up there. Um, well, 
business will can see that this sort of return on the investment of like having a counselor. So if you're if you're in a, any type of company, really they 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 try and squeeze as much money out of each individual as possible. So if you're in a, a Santander call center. The idea of paying somebody 30k salary to be a counsellor for that call centre sort of goes against the idea of capitalism. So well, he's not actually directly contributing to any kind of profit for the company, so it seems like a, a waste. But the actual the data that we're getting and the things that are associated to like the donut economy and the wellbeing economy is telling us that that investment will come back to you like three and four times just in that initial thing. And I just hope that Governments actually see this happening in private business and adopt it themselves rather than just letting them be the, the ones that run well. I think looking at the schools, uh, again, just to touch as a, as a sort of talking point with the panorama thing, like moving away from the violence reduction unit and maybe the sort of general philosophy, um, that adoption that you're talking about in business does seem to be taking at least a level of footing in like some Scottish schools. I think that's quite rewarding. And I think you were saying just before we get started that there's also movements to get towards universities and not just focus on, you know, sort of prisons and stuff like that. Um, I think that's something that's going to be really important because I think if we get at a young age and actually say to kids, like, you know, here's effective ways to dispute resolution, here's ways to avoid being violent, here's ways to come and talk about what's happening at home, yeah. whether they're you know, suffering from domestic abuse or any of these other things that we've already touched on. Like, the school is where these kids are going to spend an overwhelming majority of their time and like to have that care and that trust in them must be something that is absolutely vital and, and like probably in itself a really good indicator of the success of the, the actual school, I thought. Yeah, no, I think I think you're right. You know, schools are in the in the business of learning. Young people go to school to learn, they go to school to pass the exams to then pass through and be productive in their adult life. Um, but a lot of the issues we've talked about today have the potential to impact on their ability to learn. You know, if you don't if you if you're going to school, you don't feel safe in your relationships, then you will not learn. You know, they often mm-hmm. say no significant learning will take place without a significant relationship. We all need good, safe, supportive environments to be successful. So the workplace, we've talked about that, um, but school's the same. You know, in, in the program, you saw that relationship between the teacher and the young person. Um, it's another, another area that we worked on in the BIU was we looked at the peer mentoring in schools. How could we make use of older pupils to work with younger pupils around issues such as um, dating back, you know, domestic abuse, hate crime, looking at bullying behavior, looking at just language, inappropriate language um, that can sometimes lead, you know, we, we, you know, we, we often look at violence, the big, ex, the knife, the, the sort of knife stabbing or the explosion of violence. We often look at that, that in isolation, but these, these acts of violence don't just happen. They happen in a culture where violence yeah. is allowed, it's tolerated, where certain language is used and tolerated. And a lot of the work that I do, did in the BIU and continue to do now, it looks at this idea of the standards you walk past and the standards you accept. You know, mm-hmm. if you're in a, a school and someone's being bullied or being abused or face-to-face online, if you walk away and do nothing, are you, are you part of the problem? Um, mm-hmm. Understand, Definitely. don't walk away from, sort of, we need to understand why people do do nothing and walk away and start to help them overcome the fears. Um, you know, one thing we talk more about in society is men. You know, we, we, yeah. we and don't think whoever's listening to this this podcast and here he goes again. He's great. I'm talking about men. You know, most violence in this world is committed against men, but by men. Yeah. Suicide is, I think, three quarters of suicides in Scotland are men. Um, yeah. And you know, we're getting better at talking about that, but suicide is male violence, it's self-directed violence. But we're not very good at talking about men's violence, men's violence against men, men's violence mm-hmm. against women and children. We need to be brave enough. Most men don't commit it, commit violence, but there's just enough guys out there that muck it up for the rest of us. And we need to own this issue. And we're doing that in our schools. We're taking in these conversations into schools to really, you know, develop this anti-violence narrative. If you're living in a community where violence is the is the message, it's the tool, it's in, it's in your community, you need a counterbalance to that. You know, and, yeah, definitely. And, and we're starting to do that in schools. We're starting to do that in other settings. You know, this positive <laughs> message, because the vast majority of young boys, girls, men, women, non-binary, whoever, are good people. But you know, Philip Zimbardo, the psychologist in America, talks about the situation. 
any one of us can be in the bad situation and do bad things, or we can do nothing, or we can be the hero. He yeah. talks about the situation as being everything. So in the schoolwork we're doing, we're really trying to empower young people to be leaders in their school communities, but give them the knowledge, the skills, the tools to be, I think, you know, to, to be able to think for themselves, not to be conforming to the peer group, which is the big issue. Um, but this is the programme we, we run with Education Scotland run now, the Mentors and Violence Prevention Programme, this bystander programme, looks at young people as a solution, not as the problem. And it's a very empowering way to do it. And it, I'm, I'm a real believer in, in talking about the good, but the bad as well, but a lot more focus on what's good in society. So these are all the, the messages we can have in, in schools. And I know um, people like No Nice Better Lives are, are doing some great work in schools. And that's part of that has led to some really big reductions in, in young people carrying knives. So just before I retired or after I retired, a, a statistic 81% reduction in young people carrying weapons in the last 10 years. Wow. You know? So, that's amazing. So this, that's not an accident. You know, and violence, you know, I think in the program towards the end, Kate Silver and said violence is creeping up. And it is. You know, violence is creeping up. And Niven Rennie yeah. right, talked, about, um, talked about that. And I think we're living in, you know, COVID is just a, exposed to fault lines in society you know there's the, the us and them and it's yep. exposed that massively over the last the last three or four months and that will have a knock-on effect and what we're seeing in society and you know are things getting better in scotland i'm right they're getting better but we've still got work yep. to do and people involved in violence prevention will say that they'll never say oh, it. and like politicians will be celebrating with not so much in scotland but other politicians of you know being you know we're, we're, yeah we're doing this we're doing that it's, we've solved the problem you know violence is one of these things are we making it better or, I remember John Carnican saying to me if you're making it better keep doing it if you're making it worse stop what you're doing and do something else yeah mm -hmm. I think there's a I think this is a level of thinking particularly at a school age that I, I definitely missed it on I, when I look back at my time over sort of school and and later in university and stuff like that like in my late teens and early twenties. Violence wasn't an issue for me, but my mental health was a massive, massive issue. And I didn't, I never felt that school helped me to prepare for that in, in any meaningful way. And this was still at a time when society wasn't really talking about these things. Like Things have changed in the last 10 years, but what I'm talking about was maybe 20 plus yeah. years ago. And I look at that and I think to myself, that's amazing. Even <clears throat> simple stuff like mindfulness and, yeah. as I say, mediation, like dispute resolution. and These types of things are such important tools that, I value massively as an adult that I actually think, you know, would I have went through some of the traumatic experiences that I went through in my late teens and early twenties if mm. as part of my education I had been taught how to manage myself a wee bit better and how to actually recognise and and push back against some of the pressures that people in, in these communities feel. You know what I mean? Like, so I think in that sense, like it's absolutely amazing work. But I, I just wish it had been something that although we're pioneering in yeah, like I wish it's something we've been twenty years yeah. ahead of. You know, you're, 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 you've got some good valid points there, Matt. You know, and you know, my generation, I'm Generation X. You know, we're the generation dying by suicide with with addiction issues. You know, Generation Z, which is the generation just now, this, this is the activist generation. They're the ones out saving the planet, doing what they're doing, but they're the ones struggling with, with mental health issues. And I think what connects mm -hmm. all the generations is sometimes, especially for boys, we just expect them to get on with it. Yeah, you know that. Oh, you know, Matt, you're a boy. You, you can suck it up. You can be good because we're tough. But we can go on with it. You know, we push you know, yourself off. Yeah, and I think I think if you, if you look around the world, you know, boys are struggling. You know, there's yeah. a TED talk I often use in my in my work called the demise of guys. It's a by a guy Philip Zimbardo wrote the book. This book here, a man interrupted, and um, Phil 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 Zimbardo's TED talk, the demise of guys, talks about how boys are flaming out academically, relationships, and emotionally. Yeah. It's, it's true. You know, our boys are struggling in, in school. They are struggling in their peer relationships. They are, you know, they are struggling in their sexual relationships. You know, the boys are learning about sex and pornography. Yeah. You know, the bones frying the brain. It's frying the young brain. It's, it's defining a narrative around relationships. Um, so we need to be invested. And I think, I think, I think what, I, what I see is girls have had some really good investment over the last few years. And I'm not saying we need to be doing more for boys because girls are getting it. We need to do more for boys because boys need it. Yeah. That's fine. <clears throat> you know, I mean, you only need to look at what's going on in Lanarkshire just now running about the model area in terms of the, the cluster, the, the, the ongoing cluster of male suicides in there that almost like 
defies explanation the numbers that are coming out of that area like it's there it's happening right now you know what I mean, I mean? Mm-hmm. that's the spread of violence that's the spread the contagion of violence how it can suicide we talk about suicide clusters and I think it's you know I saw a, a, a chart a slide the other day on someone's presentation and it was like male suicide and it was almost like from the age of 15 every man has got this dark shadow following them for their whole life because the, the rates were going up up to my, you know, mm-hmm. I'm 52, you know, and it was scary. You know, it must be really scary um, for for anybody, but we're talking about young men here to have that um, that that lack of hope. And so while some men will, will externalise that violence against other people, and that might be against their, their, in their community, it might be against their wives, or their husbands, girl, their wives or girlfriends, um, but they might internalise it and do it to themselves. Yeah. And you know, I think I think we are, and it's you know, violence against you know, men's violence against men, men's violence against women, men's violence against himself. It's all connected. You know, it's that yeah. expectation. It's that expectation. Um, and I'm yeah. I'm particularly worried about like the old sort of right wing fascist ideas being appealing. Like we've we've spoke quite a lot about like why are we seeing this huge rise in sort of like bullshit ideologies that we thought died long ago but they're now starting to like come back up and we see people <clears throat> defending statues and for people that they don't even know why the statue is there it's just this sort of like and I, I mean we've, we've kind of came to this conclusion that it's a lack of community and um, I know that this might seem like a weird point of reference but if you watch the Flat Earth documentary on Netflix that shows you a group of people who think something is real that is absolutely not real it gives you a snapshot into the mind of somebody that can be radicalised in that way because they, th- these guys have been radicalised to believe a conspiracy theory that is so wildly like outside the box, but they genuinely believe it. And when they reduce it down, it's just a lack of community. The guy actually says it like, I feel at home with these people because yeah. without them, I've got nothing. Um, is, do you think that that's it? Like, if we can try and like create the community again and try and build up the community again, that we'll stop seeing this Football Lad Alliance and Tommy Robinson getting thousands of people um, marching and his and back. Cells, etc. Oh, yeah, you're right. You know, uh, like, you can apply that to gangs as well. You know, you know, giving people the alternative and the work the BIU did in the early years, the BIU about about giving people an alternative to the gang. You mm-hmm. know, and, and, and building relationships. I hope is important. And anyway, right, just now we see. Um, you know, lots of people talking about there's a war against men. They use that phrase, there's a war against men. And yeah. You know what? Yeah, and, and, and they'll say, yeah, you know, men are dying, suicide, drugs to death, homelessness, imprisonment, you know, all these things. And yeah, you know what? These are all issues, challenges that we see with men. You know, our prison rates, men, homelessness, mostly men, drug deaths, mostly men, suicide, mostly men, um, bad attainment in schools, you know, um, people being chucked out of schools, boys, boys and men. So something's going on, but where's what's what's leading to that? I, I don't think it's and a lot of a lot of men. You talked about insoles, Matt. You talked about the men's rights activists. They often blame blame feminism. Yeah, <clears throat> you know, women have been getting it good for forty years. You know what? Well, women have been getting off their backsides and doing the work. If I was yeah. to be honest, and I'm, I'm, if anybody wants to come back at me on that, listening to this, feel free. But I think women have been up there doing fantastic work, not just for girls, but for boys as well. Because how many young boys are sexually assaulted by men every single year? Mm -hmm. This is just, you know, women have been up there doing fantastic work um, advocating for for men as well, but for young girls and for for young boys. Men just spend the time fighting back. Because I think men are uncomfortable with what's going on. So I said before... There's definitely a certain type of man that does not like... sees. feminists and female success is a challenge to their masculinity when that really should never be the case. Mm-hmm. Not, not at all. And, and, and to answer you, you know, feminism, you know, is, you, know, you know, if you believe in equality, you know, I've got, I've got two daughters, I want the best of my daughters, so does that, that makes me a feminist. Yeah, you know, that's, that's fine. But I think there's a, there's, a, there's a small number of men that are scared of that because, you know, if you talk about male violence, they're quick to come back and say things like, oh, but women are violent as well. It's like Black Lives Matter is a classic one. All Lives yeah. Matter. It's the same analogy. Absolutely. Same analogy. You know, let's talk about Black Lives. You know, they do. You know, All Lives Matter. Fact. And people from Black Lives Matter, they, they would agree with you. But for this yeah. moment, we want to focus on Black Lives. It's like, 
you know, if I'm doing a, doing a, a session on um, um, violence against women, people will always say to me, oh, well, what about women's violence against men? And I'll say, you know what, we'll, come, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. But just now I want to talk about, you know, men's violence against women. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and I think, I think for, for some men, they find it really uncomfortable. Like I, you know, for me as a, as a man, it took, it took, you know, I lost my dad to suicide in 2008. It took a friend of mine, someone close to me, to be a victim of a sexual assault for me to realize what the hell's going on with, with, with men. Wow. And it, it was meeting people in my, in my life. Um, you know, a friend of mine in America, Jackson Cat. So I interviewed Jackson a few days ago doing a similar podcast thing. And, you know, I said to Jackson, you know, you, you, when I picked you up from the plane in 2010, you said, he said to me, Graham, okay, you're a police officer, but you're a dad. Go to tell me what you're doing. Or he didn't, he didn't, he didn't you say, go to tell me, because he's from America. But he, <laughs> yeah. said, but he said, tell me what you're going to do as a man to stop violence. And it's the first time somebody put me on the spot and asked me. And when he started to speak to me like that, it made me, it made things a lot clearer as to what was going on. Yeah. And it made me realize what happened to my dad. It made me realize what was going on, like the, the person involved in the sexual assault and the perpetrator. You know, you could put a line of 10 guys up in a row and, and, and try and spot the sex offender. You ain't going to do it nine times out of 10 because they, they're just got their guys. Um, so we need to be brave enough as men to start to be asking ourselves some questions. What's going on? And move from a place of being uncomfortable because a lot of men get to that uncomfortable space and they fight back. You know, that television program I did with BBC Four it was, it yeah. was um, into the manosphere. You know, with the, with the man there, you know, that was his mindset. He any time I tried to talk about men's um, poor behaviour, he would get very defensive. Yeah. Very defensive. So I've seen this. This was one movie we kind of touched on just beforehand. And just for anybody that's not seen it, you did a. I think it was like BBC Three, BBC Four. You did a sort of half hour where you met. Um, a German men's rights activist who lived in the Highlands yeah. um, and I think you went to a convention, a men's rights convention in America when was that right? Oh, he went there himself. Oh he went himself. Yeah. Yeah. That was an interesting group of people he bought and it kind of harks back to that kind of alt-right thing that Paul's talking about where you know this notion of sort of almost kind of like toxic masculinity which is a phrase that's so overused I hate yeah, bringing like it. it up but at the same time you know, for the sake of this, you know, that toxic masculinity is being used against people to radicalise them. Um, and I think that that conference in America is almost a kind of textbook example of what Paul was talking about. And I think it's something that we do need to be wary. And I think one of the things that impressed me most about that show and stuck with me the most was the way that you engaged with the guy. And I think it's something that's reflective of the approach in sort of violence reduction is to say yeah, it's not going to be comfortable, but like growth never is. Like yeah. we need to make these challenges head on. We need to be respectful. We need to listen, and we need to try and you know meet somewhere in the middle. And when I watched the BBC thing, like I was, I mean, I couldn't have done it. There was with the bits where he was shouting at people in his shop. I mean, I wouldn't have been able to lend any further credibility to the guy. But he kept plugging away, and like I think that was like really important because although he didn't change his mind, like. I think he was also perfectly aware that somebody was there who was actually listening to him. Yeah, I think Phil, Phil was one of these guys where, you know, yeah, he, had, he, had, he had a mindset. And we, you know what? We actually agree in loads. You know, toxic masculinity. I hate that word. I, I hate even saying it because, you know, yeah. masculinity in itself isn't toxic. You know, it's yeah. the acts. It's the acts that are. It's the acts of some men that are the problem. And we will always def- be defined like as a police officer, police officers are defined by the worst behaviour of a police officer. You know, and that's why you see the, the pushback in the police. And I yeah. think it's the same for men. We will be defined by the worst behaviours of our fellow men. And, you know, it's, 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 it's right where, where feminists are and, and women from women's organisations get angry and upset about men's violence. And they're right to, to, to challenge us because we, most men's um, starting point is, you know what, I don't abuse, it's nothing to do with me. Right, that's nonsense. Yep. Absolute nonsense. And I think Phil was one of these guys who, when but when you started to talk about men's the issues with men, he just wasn't comfortable. wasn't comfortable with that. And he's a product of <clears throat> the, the, the the sort of that you know that yes no yes no. You're right. I try and go in the middle. I, I, I like the space between to try and have that conversation. And for, and if we're not careful just now, unless we change the conversation to something more positive around boys and men, our boys are at risk of going towards some of these, what yeah, we might call, fires for men. 
the so-called messiahs from men. We talked about, you know, the, all the guys that you saw with, with Phil. Um, there's some people down south who's, who are constantly talking this war on boys, this war on men. And we needed, you know, my, my friend Don McPherson wrote a book called You Throw Like a Girl. And um, Don was an ex-NFL football player in America. And he talks about as a sport, as a sportsman in the NFL, masculinity was tough, getting there, knock, knock the head, the shit out of people, get the job done. And he, he calls for a more aspirational conversation on, on masculinity, something that is something that's weak, that, that is positive. Because, yeah. you know, one thing you, you know, Paul, Matt and I will share will be some real good values around respect, integrity, you know, to be the best person that we can be. Yeah. Uh, and we're not violent. Right. You touched on this in your article about um, role models, yeah? Yeah, we, we, and so we, we need people to go out and role model this stuff. We need to talk about it. We need to yeah. use this phrase, what you promote, you permit. It's like talking about suicide. You know, we can't just expect people, men, to talk. You, you, we all need to go out there and create the, the conditions for our friends to talk. We need to listen to our friends, listen to prevent. You know, if your friend, you know, if you're out with your friends and your male friend and oh, I'm fine, you know, dig if you're not sure. If you spot, yeah. that's telling you and you keep digging because that's friendship. So yeah, I think, funny. yeah, that program of Phil was a strange one. I'm glad I did it. I got a lot of good, good feedback from people saying you had patience with this guy. Um, and he, you know, I think he doesn't, he doesn't follow me on Twitter anymore. Um, um, but that's fine. You know, I, I, you know I'm not going to change the world, you know, yeah. in, in its entirety. But, you know, there's people that, you know, have been influenced by some thinking um, from myself, but I've been influenced by other people. It's, these are not... These mm-hmm. are not it's me, it's influenced from other people. Yeah. Are you get any sort of level of concern about, I mean, I think that for me, the rise that we've seen in the last couple of years has probably got a lot to do with Brexit, austerity, just the, the political shit show that we see like on a sort of day-to-day basis. I think that there's no... When I, I, remember, I, I moved up the West End of Glasgow for Shettleston about four years ago, and just before I left Shettleston, I noticed more of the sort of street atmosphere that I grew up in, sort of returning to Shettleston in a, wee, a sort of strange way and it was getting a wee bit sort of, right, I'm going to move up the West End because I'm no like Nephilia a wee bit and that was my first indicator. So I think that that happened in the sort of austerity years. And But I think that we could have a conversation about that, but I think that that's probably went side by side with the, the slight increase. But do you have a serious concern about the impact of COVID? Because... We're talking a lot about schools being the the first line of defence and I think that that documentary, the Panorama episode, absolutely demonstrated how that's the case. Um, The BBC, the woman that was presenting it, was sort of dumbfounded that the headmistress wasn't giving people into trouble for being 15, 20, 45 minutes late, but instead was asking them why and if they gave a a legit, okay, they trusted her to give a legit explanation, she let them just go to class without reprimanding them. Um, But... With that being taken away, I mean, I would imagine a lot of the violence must be learned in the household. It must be the example of sort of like violent dads or like what they're seeing round about them, like their environment. And now they've been thrusted <coughs> into that environment for like three, four months with no break. Um, we hear stuff about kids, the only meal that they get is when they go to school. Like, do you have a concern that this is going to have a lasting impact on the rise in violent crime or it might continue? I think the good thing is that we're talking about it. You know, Nevin, Nevin from the BIU talked about it in the programme, so we are aware of it. Um, and I think, you know, what was nice in that programme was the, was the relationships that teachers had with these young people. You know, there's some, there's some young people in 2020 who by 10 o'clock in the morning have lived a whole day. You know, they've, they've, they've lived an entire day because the, the fear they have in the house, not being fed, looking after their mum, looking after their dad, um, you know, caring for a, a younger sibling. And they come to school... <laughs> You know, and I think if we, you know, if we just kept, but I think the good thing that we have now is that people understand that now. More, mm. A lot of school teachers are talking about nurture, talking about trauma-informed approaches, so they're aware of this, especially in some parts of Glasgow, Edinburgh, or wherever, that this could be a reality. You know, domestic abuse. Well, there'll never be peace in the in the streets to have peace in the home. You know, we need to really get into that. So that's just something that schools are aware of now. Policing is focusing a lot on domestic abuse. Um, so I think, yeah, I, COVID, COVID is completely, you know, I remember in 2010, 11, with the, with the austerity kicking in and seeing a, 
a chart saying, yeah, this will be sort of 18, 17, 18, we'll start to come out of austerity. There was a, a, there was a delay expected then, so it will be another couple of years, and we've been hit with this. Christ. And we're seeing, you know, I was up in Edinburgh yesterday, and it's the first time I've been in Edinburgh, and, I, and the one o'clock gun scared the daylights out of me, because it's quite a quiet, eerie place, Edinburgh now. And the mm, gun went yeah. off. I just about crap myself when the gun went off. So shops, there's some shops not opening. There's lots of businesses not there. So, yeah, I've got concerns for people's occupation, people's employment prospects, not just young people, but for adults as well. Um, I'm with you. I think and, in itself, COVID could be, you know, considered a trauma. When we, if we talk about, you know, adverse childhood experiences, like, you know, COVID and the pandemic is going to be an adverse experience for all, I mean, this is the first time any has ever went through this. So to have, you know, other vulnerable groups like kids and stuff like that to consider, like, there's going to have to be a balance, I think, in terms of how that trauma is managed because we've all had to go through it. And I think we'll all have yeah. unique and individual things that need to be addressed. But to touch on the, the domestic abuse side, I think when you were talking earlier on about how violence is a disease and how you can become infected, like, when we talk about people who are exposed to that in their homes, like, I remember and it's maybe something that's went by the way, but I remember growing up and it wasn't the uncommon for you to become what your dad became or you to move into the same business that your mother became. Now. In those terms, like if you're in a house that's violent, like you are going to go up to become a perpetrator of violence. And I think these are all things that I, it's great, it's great we're talking about them, but I think we need like plans of action to deal with it like now. And I, like, I don't know how, how, viable that is when we're still in the midst of it but I don't, I don't know that's one of the ones that's going to it's important to do, on me. yeah it's important to realise that it's not inevitable if you're living in a violent yeah. household you, it doesn't mean you will be a violent perpetrator yeah, yeah. Violence, right and I think I think you know that, you know that adverse child experience the A study you talked about and I think James talked about you know <clears> but we can't ignore the impact of adversity in childhood you know the we know that the, the way you're nurtured will affect your biology. It will affect the way the brain is wired. And whilst the mind might forget, the body won't forget. And I think the good thing, you know, some good things have come out of COVID. You know, we've seen, we've seen some really coming together of communities, um, people looking out for each other. Yeah. We need yeah. more of that. And we don't just stop because we're now allowed to go to the pub. We've got to keep it going. In the pub, we've got to be speaking to our mates and listening to our mates. And just making sure checking in with our mates, checking in with people, making sure they're okay, checking in with our neighbours. Because we've done it for the last 13 weeks, but we shouldn't stop now because we've been allowed to go out. It needs yeah. to continue. So these are the protective factors that I think, you know, relationships are, are key for all of us. And all of us are in the business of relationships. You know, you're doing this podcast, you are people are sitting listening to this and you know, thinking, maybe thinking differently, maybe thinking it's a lot of nonsense, Graham. It's Graham speaking, that's fine. But maybe some people are thinking, you know what? Yeah, I've got a role here. Getting out there and speaking to their friends, speaking to their neighbours, speaking to their mums, their dads, their brothers, their sisters, if they think something's not right. So we can, yeah, I have fears. Um, but I think if we keep these types of conversations going and start to equip communities with um, tools and strategies to respond, it might help a little bit. But no, we need, we need, these are systemic problems we're, we're facing just now. Yeah. We need loads of different solutions, not just one, not just the, you know, the, the half price food for a month from the government. We need my, it's going <laughs> to put, put people back a long way. Um, you know, and yeah, I've got two daughters who are in their mid twenties. I know, I know what will affect them in the future. You know, my youngest one is going into social work, so she might be busy, you know, <laughs> for that yeah. one. So, yeah, it's, it's a tough time for a lot of people. And I think in Scotland, we are, we've got the opportunity to do things a lot quicker. We're, we're a compact nation, one government, um, whether you're a yes or no independent supporter. I think nationalism in Scotland is not the nationalism we see in south, down south. Yep. It's a bit more mm -hmm. equality and trying to do the best. Can, we, can the government do better? Of course they can do better. We've got one police force. So we've got the capacity to do things a lot quicker, I think, in Scotland. We've got the BIU in place. We've got, you know, the Community Justice Authority and I think that Karen runs, Karen McCluskey runs, looking at justice and smart justice and, and that. We've got like we've got defence lawyers like Egan, Ian Keegan-Smith talking about, you know, you know he's a, a defence lawyer who um, 
you know, defence lawyers and the police are the guys that make all the cash out of the criminals. But Ian's now thinking, ah, this isn't right. You know, a lot of people that I, I work with, Ian works with, are traumatised young men. I need to be helping them. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've got we've got Suzanne Zedek, who's the psychologist, talking about connection. So there's some really good people out there who need to be just given that space to talk about all of these issues that we're doing. Because, yeah, we've got some dark times coming away, but I think there's potential for us to, to get to come together. To, 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 I think that, that's where the answers lie. It's coming together. Mm. Amazing, man. Right. What do you think, Matt? Have we got anything else? I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good with what we've got so far, mate. Okay. So it's, it's just hit the hours. And I think, like, having a sort of crescendo on a sort of positive note like that, where I'm hearing, like, an expert say there's hope and we need yeah. to just come together and take the positives out of, like, the COVID situation. Because me and Matt have been talking about this since the start. I mean, I think one of the first podcasts we did after lockdown, me and Matt were talking about like what are the potential positives that individuals can get out of this situation it doesn't need to always be negative and I think like that's an amazing place to stop yeah I think absolutely is, yeah there has been some positives coming out of this and we've got to keep yeah we'll keep moving with that definitely yeah man um, that's been amazing I really appreciate your time um, it's just absolutely flown by so that, that's yeah, usually a pretty good sign that we've got a cracker on my hands mm-hmm. um, so that's thanks very fine. much and like good touch and you know aye, check it again and we can talk about something else you know absolutely I'm, I'm trying to do a lot of online stuff just now because I've put all my work online um, because that's the way things are going my training yeah. work that online um, and I'm, I'm doing some podcasts with some people who have influenced me over the years so I've got a lot I'm putting a lot of that on Twitter so I'm nice. using that in my, my, my content as well because I think that's the way things are going. And what can, where can people find you on Twitter? What's your, what's your app? Exactly, but I was just going to ask. It's uh, at Graham underscore Goulden. Um, it's, uh, it's G-O-U-L-D-E-N and my website is just grahamgoulden.com. Um, you can find out a bit what, more what I do, what makes me tick. Um, I'm also running a website with an American friend called The Cultivating Minds Project which just two two guys, he's a teacher, I'm an ex-cop, and we're just talking about masculinity, we're talking about community. So I'll, I'll share some of that with you as well. Oh Outstanding. man, it would be awesome if we could get his both on, we could maybe do a podcast about masculinity. Hi, Alan, Alan would love that. Alan Heisterkamp's a friend of mine from Iowa, and um, yeah, we share a lot, so that conversation around men would be a good one, he'd be up for that. Oh, amazing. Then we'll, we'll definitely reach out about that, but again, just to echo what Matt said, that flown by it's been brilliant to talk to you and just want to thank you for the work that you've done in the past and that you're continuing to do mate it's amazing yeah. no, and I said it's that guys thank you for the work you do because you're, you're getting these conversations out there and don't underestimate that work it's important especially at this time amazing cheers, mate thank you very much buddy cheers man bye Take care. cheers guys see ya Set to 
fade You call the party Thank you.